Hello, how's it going? I just want to share something with you real quick. Some uh, Talk about some different interpretations of Revelation and what I'm looking into, what I'm going to be looking into in the next month, in the next um, coming months or whatever, until I feel like I get a good grasp on this. Um, between going back and forth between different things. But anyways, the book of Revelation. Um, you know, I've changed my views on so many things about eschatology, you know, the second coming of Christ, and, you know, how I said that happens, you know, basically at death, and there is no such thing as a rapture. I don't believe that the millennial kingdom is a literal, physical, future kingdom. So there's basically, you know, a few different interpretations of Revelation that are popular, you know, um, you know three or four of them or so in general, if we generalize them, and... Um, Anyways, the one that I'm looking at into now is the idealism or the spiritual interpretation of Revelation, and a lot of people don't like that because it kind of leave, leaves things open, and uh, I don't like that either. I mean, I like to, you know, get things down to a fine point where I can say, you know, this is exactly what's being taught and everything, but um, this seems to be so far the best approach that I've found because for one there's preterism and they believe you know things happen in the past or partially I'm not sure exactly how that goes but you know they say that the second coming was in 70 AD and you know the, the abomination of desolation happened around then um, not sure exactly how that goes but it's really shady because you know they say that all these events that happen in the past is what what's being spoken of in the Re in the book of Revelation. You know how can we really be for sure? And besides that, I just I don't like a lot of their interpretations of the passages either. Like um, I don't know. Um, how do you spell that? I don't know. I'll try to find something. There's like a verse in the book of Revelation where it says like Jesus is coming or something like that and even those who pierced him will see him. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So here's Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 it says, Behold he comes with he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him even so amen so there a lot of people have false interpretations of this i believe because they think that this is the second coming they think this is some event where everybody on earth is going to see jesus descending from the clouds or something but no i think it's more of a general uh, figure of speech kind of way that jesus is the judge of all and all are going to come before him uh, you know, at some point. And so, see, the preterists, the people who say that everything happened in the past, they're going to say that, see, it says those who pierced him. So some of the people who were involved in his crucifixion, they have to be, uh, they had to be alive when, when, when Christ was going to be seen coming in the clouds. And so I think that's a false interpretation. And I think, you know, the futurist interpretation is false too. Um, so I, I see this more as a general statement that everybody's going to see him as judge, as Lord. Um, you know, they're going to know that he is God. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a bad day for those who, who never turn to him. But, you know, that's at the time of judgment, at the time of death, basically. So, um... And he cometh with clouds, you know, that could mean that he comes with judgment or something. So it doesn't mean literal physical clouds. It's symbolic, it's figurative language, and there's so much symbolism and figurative language in the book of Revelation. It's, um, you know, it's packed full of that. It's the most, probably the most symbolic book in the Bible, you know. So we have to be really careful about that. And so I don't believe the, the preterist interpretations that everything happened in 70 AD and you know they try to say that the beast was Nero or whatever and, you know um, but then there's the futurist interpretation and that includes a lot of different you know the post-trib uh, you know it includes all the pre-millennial stuff it includes post-millennial um, pretty much all of that um, and maybe even amillennial. I'm not sure exactly what amillennialism falls under like that. But basically, I used to say that, 
you know, the post-trib rapture and premillennialism is like the most consistent, you know, um, interpretation of the end times passages, but I'm finding that I was completely wrong. And I think that it's actually one of the worst, unfortunately, because like I said, you know, there's, I don't believe that there's this future antichrist person. Uh, it's just a doctrine that people put together. It doesn't, it doesn't go together. And, um, I don't think, you know, that the millennial kingdom is literal, physical. I don't believe the Bible teaches a bodily resurrection, the body is, you know, done away with. And, uh, I believe that the second coming is, you know, basically of what happens at death. And so all that stuff, the futurism just really completely teaches completely different stuff that's really foreign to scripture. It seems like it's so biblical, but the more you study and stuff, it doesn't, uh, it's not consistent with, with anything really. So it's like way out there. So I reject the preterist. I reject the futurism and all that, that, is involved in that and um, and another big interpretation here is this idealism or just uh, and this is just a, an article on Wikipedia so I'm gonna be looking more into this I'm sure there's lots of different interpretations in this but um, it says here idealism is called the spiritual approach the allegorical approach the non-literal approach and many other names you know, there's some people who believe this in the early church, like Origen and um, Origen and Augustine, and you know they have plenty of problems. Uh, and I don't believe that we need to go by what's in the early church, but uh, you know they were right about some things, extremely wrong about other things. You know, heretical. But. Um, but it's good to know that there's lots of other people that have believed this, I guess, at least. So it's not just, you know, one crazy person has taught this. Okay, so it does have a little bit of where other people have believed this in the past. And Augustine's one of the people who pretty much, who, uh, you know, defended the Trinity and stuff really well. But, you know, he did have a lot of other problems. So, you know, that's Cal John Calvin basically got a lot of his teachings from Augustine. And Augustine was basically like a Catholic, so, um, but you know, for the work that he did with the Trinity, that was good, and you know, maybe this was something else that he was right about. But anyways, it's just, I just mentioned that, uh, but it might not be one of the most popular views today. A lot of peop people will probably reject this, uh, but to me it seems like so far one of the more plausible interpretations um, hmm. so maybe I'll just read this whole article I'm not saying that I agree with all this or anything I'm just gonna share this what it says on Wikipedia and so this Jacob guy writes that the idealist eschatology came out as uh, Renaissance thinkers began to doubt the kingdom of heaven had been established on earth or would be established but still believed in its establishment. Rather than the kingdom of heaven being present in society, it, it is established subjectively for the individual. And this other guy here, uh, F.D. Maurice, interpreted the kingdom of heaven idealistically as a symbol representing society's general improvement instead of a physical or political kingdom. Uh, Karl Barth interprets eschatology as representing existential truths that bring the individual hope rather than history or future history. Barth's ideas provi provided fuel for the social gospel philosophy in America, which saw social change not as performing required good works, but because the individuals felt that Christians should not simply ignore society's problems with future dreams. Hmm... Different authors have suggested... Now this is what I really wanted to read from this article, because I kind of looked at it earlier. Different authors have suggested that the beast represents various social injustices, such as exploitation of workers, wealth, the elite, commerce, materialism, and imperialism. Various uh, Christian anarchists, such as... Uh, I don't know... 
have identified the state and political power as the beast. Hmm. It is distinct from preterism, futurism, and historicism in that it does not see any of the prophecies except in some cases the second coming and the final judgment as being fulfilled in a literal, physical, earthly sense, either in past, present, or future, and that to interpret the eschatological positions of the Bible in a historical or future historical fashion is an erroneous understanding. So I have to agree with some of that. There's another article that I'll show, too, here in Bible Study Tools a little bit that I thought was interesting. But I'm just saying, I'm just looking into this, and I'm just sharing this with you. If this is something that you're interested in, if you never heard of this, I'm sure there's a lot online. I'm going to start looking up articles and and who teaches this stuff and how they view Revelation. Um Let's see, Mounts and Osborne provided a good summary of the idealist approach to interpreting the book of Revelation as proponents hold that Revelation is not to be taken in reference to any specific events at all, but as an expression of those basic principles in which God acts throughout history. The idealist approach continues the allegorical interpretation which dominated exegesis throughout the medieval period and still finds favor with those inclined to minimize the historical character of the uh, coming consummation. Its weakness lies in the fact that it denies to the book any specific historical fulfillment. Okay, and so I might not agree with everything they say on here. That might not be really a weakness. I mean, we have to judge by, you know, verse by verse, really, and stuff. That's where our, that's where, um, you know, if it's flawed or not, that's where we have to look. Um, so, they can't, I'm not just going to listen to some general statements that people make about this. They're going to have to point out verse, verses and stuff, why this is wrong. But anyways, this, this popular approach argues that the symbols do not relate to historical events, but rather to timeless spiritual truths. As such, it relates primarily to the church between the advents, that is, between Christ's first and second comings. Thus, it concerns the battle between good and evil and between the church and the world at all times in church history. The millennium in this approach is not a future event, but the final cycle of the book describing the church age. Okay. So, and I'm not exactly what it, what how I would say what the millennial kingdom is, but I would say that... Uh, it's not a physical, literal future thousand years on the earth. Um, anyways, by employing allegorical interpretation, the book is reduced to a symbolic exhibition of good versus evil. The more moderate form of allegorical interpretation following Augustine regards the book of Revelation as presenting in a symbolic way the total conflict between Christianity or evil, or as Augustine put it, the city of God versus the city of Satan. Idealists have much in common with preterists and that they avoid an understanding of the book of Revelation which would seem to be describing future events. See, that's kind of like arbitrary arguments and stuff, you see. They avoid an understanding of the book of Revelation, okay? Not really. It's just an understanding that some people don't agree with, apparently. But again, you have to go by verse by verse. And that's where the arguments have to be based. You can't just say stuff like this. But I'm sure I'll probably get plenty of comments from people saying stuff like that. <laughs> just arbitrary. Um, this doesn't mean anything. Okay, they avoid an understanding of the book. No, their understanding is just different. And apparently, for some reason, you don't think that's right. But here again, there is an overemphasis on the readers of John's day, as if the book were only written to describe historic events of their time and hold devotional value for those that follow. Hmm. Its flaw is not so much in what it affirms as in what it denies. Many idealists could be classed as preterists since they hold that the imagery of the apocalypse is taken from its immediate world and that the prevailing conditions of Demation's reign, I don't know, are reflected in the symbolic episodes that fill its pages. And I don't agree with this, because I think idealism is a lot different than preterism. Like I said, I could, I don't agree with preterism. There's lots of things that I could point to that are that are wrong with that, just the interpretation of the, the verses. So I don't think it's the same as preterism, okay? But futurist people who believe that there will be a future Antichrist, they believe that there will be a bodily resurrection and all these things, that's probably why they would put preterism and idealism together, because they think that, 
you know, they think that all that stuff that they believe, which I did before, is true, and it's not. There's lots of errors there. So it's it would actually be that preterism and idealism is closer to the truth than futurism. So, anyways, they refuse to assign them any literal historical significance for the future, and they deny all pre predictive prophecy except in the most general sense that the ult of the ultimate triumph of righteousness. The problem with this alternative is that it holds that Revelation does not depict any final consummation to history, whether in God's final victory or in the last judgment of the realm of evil. Um, so here's Idealist. Calkins summarizes, uh, summarizes idealism in five propositions. Number one, it is an irresistible summons to heroic living. Two, the book contains matchless appeals to endurance. Three, it tells us that evil is marked for overthrow in the end. Four, it gives us a new and wonderful picture of Christ. Five, the apocalypse reveals to us the fact that history is in the mind of God and in the hand of Christ as the author and reviewer of the moral destinies of men. And so, you know, I like some of the stuff that was said there, but... Thus, the capstone of biblical revelation, chock full of self-proclaimed prophetic relevance, is reduced to something akin to a de devotional. Okay. This person doesn't agree with idealism, obviously. It's... Idealism also suffers from an inconsistency of interpretation where small sections are interpreted literally, but then the interpreter reverts back to symbolism and allegory. Everybody does that in the book of Revelation because it is symbolic. It is figurative. Okay. <laughs> There is no clear or consistent means for determining when the shift should occur. A fundamental mistake is made when the fact that John is receiving revelation through a series of visions is seen as a license to hold that John's communication is something less than logically coherent. <sighs> okay. Yeah, so this person doesn't agree with idealism, but... I thought maybe there was some other good stuff in here, but I don't know. Hmm. Anyways. Yeah, I don't agree with all that so much. I don't remember, I don't think that I really looked at any other articles so far. Um, maybe it was this one. There is a book I'm looking at maybe getting in the future, but first I want to try to find all the articles that I can get on here. But there's one that's like four different views on the book of Revelation. But I mean, I'm convinced already that the preterist view is wrong and the futurist view is wrong. So, you know, what's left after that? Here's the idealist view. Um, I'll try to read through this, I guess, too. This might be an excerpt from this book, um, Four Views of Revelation. Or maybe this is... I don't know. Anyways, the idealist view. The first view of Revelation is the idealist view or the spiritual view. This view see, uses the allegorical method to interpret the book of Revelation. The allegorical approach to Revelation was introduced by ancient church father Origen and made prominent by Augustine. According to this view, the events of Revelation are not tied to specific historical events. The imagery of the book symbolically presents the ongoing struggle throughout the ages of God against Satan and good against evil. In this struggle, the saints are persecuted and martyred by the forces of evil, but will one day receive their vindication. See, so far, I like that a lot. So, actually, I like this article probably the best that I've read. Um, I don't... Anyways, um, in the end, God is victorious, amen, and his sovereignty is displayed throughout the ages. Robert Mounts summarizes the idealist view, stating, Revelation is a theological poem presenting the ageless struggle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Or like Augustine said, the, king, the city of God versus the city of Satan. <laughs> It is a philosophy, philosophy of history wherein Christian forces are continuously meeting and conquering the demonic forces of evil. In his commentary on Revelation, late 19th century scholar William Milligan stated, while the apocalypse thus embraces the world, the whole period, sorry, while the apocalypse thus embraces the whole period of the Christian dispensation, it sets before us with, within this period the action of great principles and not special incidents, we are not to look at the apocalypse for special events, both for the exhibition of the principles 
which govern the history of both the world and the church. The symbols in Revelation are not tied to specific events, but point to themes throughout church history. The battles in Revelation are viewed as spiritual warfare manifested in the persecution of Christians or wars in general that have occurred in history. The beast from the sea may be identified as the satanically inspired political opposition to the church in any age. The beast from the land represents pagan or corrupt religion to Christianity. The harlot represents the compromised church or the seduction of the world in general. Each seal, trumpet, and bull represents natural disasters, wars, famines, and the like which occur as God works out his plan in history. Catastrophes represent God's displeasure with sinful man. However, sinful mankind goes through these catastrophes while refusing to turn and repent. God ultimately triumphs in the end. The strength of this view is that it avoids the problem of harmonizing passages with events in history. Okay, so yeah, that would be like the preterism thing, I think. And it also makes the book of Revelation applicable and relevant for all periods of church history. However, there are several weaknesses of this view, and I might not agree with that. Okay, First of all, this view denies the book of Revelation any specific historical fulfillment. The symbols portray the ever-present conflict, but no necessary consummation of the historical process. Revelation 1.1 states that the events will come to pass shortly, giving the impression that John is prophesying future historical events, but that is not how that verse has to be interpreted. So, let's see. Yeah, so that's basically about it. You know, everybody has a, uh, I don't know. Everybody has a bias, I guess, or they have their own view already when they're writing this stuff, so they don't believe that. But I agree with this a lot. I like what I read, how you know, what the beast represents, what the seals and the trumpets and bulls represent. It can represent many things, you know, throughout time. And um, there are principles and lessons that to be learned from Revelation, and we can look at, you know, general themes and things, but we shouldn't get down to, you know, exactly, you know, what's this and what's that and what's this, and everything has to mean something specifically, and it all has to be some kind of future fulfillment. Um, there's, there's way too much error in the futurist interpretation. It's absolutely false. And so is preterism. So what's left? That's all I'm saying. And looks like right now the idealist approach is a uh, the best um, interpretation. But I want to read more about what people have said. I want to read about you know the how they interpret different things. And... Uh, I'm going to have to read through the book of Revelation a lot more times myself, but um, it's very symbolic, and I think we just need to understand that it's uh, just a beautiful story to encourage us and um, help us. So, that's that. I just thought I'd share that. Man, so I love you guys. God bless.